Watching Gears, brought to you by Holly Performance Products. Fuel your passion. And Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals. Hey, welcome to Gears. You know, for a long time, when you were looking for a project vehicle, the general thought was to find the most pristine, original thing you could and build it up from there. And if you can find something like that and turn it into a project, well, that's awesome. But <laughs> that's getting harder every day because most vehicles now have been through two or three owners and they've done their modifications to it. So your new project not only needs your modification, but there's a good chance you're going to have to change or remove something that somebody else has done. And that means you're going to have some surprises, good or bad. And nowhere is that more prevalent than in an old 4x4, because everybody modifies those things. Prime example is the 77 Jeep CJ5. Now, we got this for a good deal, because it's been sitting for a long time. It's got some mechanical issues, it's not running, and the owner didn't want to mess with it. So, that's how we bought it, as a non-runner. But, one look at the rust-free body, and the rare V8 Levi edition, and we knew it had some serious potential. Even with the worn out seats and the saggy rear springs and the fact that at least two of the shocks are in the passenger floorboard, it was obvious that this had been someone's pride and joy at one time. So we're going to dig into several areas on this old Jeep, starting with this suspension. <laughs> okay, a quick look underneath tells us a lot about this old Jeep. Other than the shocks being gone, it obviously has some lift springs on it, but they're sagging and the bushings are rotten. Also, the front brake hoses were never extended, so those are too short and bound up, and it's a wonder they haven't popped over the years. The rear brake hose was just left loose to get enough slack in the line, and there's also been a sway bar added in the rear, but it looks like it quit working a long time ago. Fortunately, these are all easy fixes. This is Skyjacker's 4-inch lift kit for the CJ5, and they've been building these since this thing was practically new. So they got it dialed in. Now take a look at this. You got four new leaf springs with a four inch lift built right into the spring. So there's no lift blocks necessary. Then as you can see, you got wedges on the rear springs that are bolted in place. And this corrects the angle of the rear end and lines your drive shaft up correctly. Very important. Then you have modern urethane bushings. You have new U-bolts. We finished it off with some gas shocks. Now, to take care of the brake hose issue, we got extended brake hoses front and rear, and finally, a new steering stabilizer to take care of any wobble that might try to sneak in. Very simple parts that pretty much anybody can put on in their driveway. Let's get to work. The first step is to unbolt the axle from the leaf springs. Make sure you have plenty of penetrating lube, And don't be surprised if you need to cut off some rusty U-bolts. Next, we'll get a jack under the axle to support it and remove the old leaf springs and bolt in the new ones. Since we're going to be reusing the spring brackets, a quick cleanup and a coat of paint will make them look like new. The longer brake hoses fit right in place of the original hoses, and the performance shocks are direct replacements as well. Okay, that takes care of the lift and suspension, but we're not completely done over here, because remember, this vehicle's been sitting for seven to 10 years, and we have no idea how it was used before that. So it's a good idea to look through things and look for potential problems. For example, notice how this sway bar is all locked up and not working properly. It needs to be taken apart, cleaned up, and re-lubed. Also, check out these hubs. Now, anytime you're getting that kind of movement in a hub, you not only have loose bearings, but they're probably shot. Also, you need to check your tie rod ends, your ball joints, all of your steering linkage, because any movement or slop in these areas can contribute to steering wander, steering wobble, all kinds of steering issues. And the stabilizer is not meant to fix all that. Also, since we're under here, we might as well change the lube and the differentials and the transmission and the transfer case, because I guarantee that hasn't been done in a long time.
Hey, welcome back to Gears. Well, we're showing you how to take somebody's old project and make it your new project. Yeah, and a great example of that is this old 77 Jeep CJ5. Because obviously it was owned by an enthusiast at one time, but then it swapped owners several times. People did their own work to it and it ended up not running. Nobody knew anything about it. And that is very typical of what you might find out there, which means this kind of project is not only about you doing what you want to do to it, but it's also about fixing, maybe restoring something that somebody else has done. So first thing we did was pull off that piece together four inch lift. For example, we replaced the old piece together four inch lift with a new Skyjacker lift, shocks and extended brake hoses. We also corrected some wheel bearing and suspension issues and put new gear lube in the axles, the transmission and the transfer case. Okay, with all that being done, it is time to deal with that engine. Now remember, we got this as a non-runner, but the seller did say that that motor was freshly rebuilt. It's just been sitting for a long time because of clutch issues. So we're going to see if we can get to the bottom of that. Also, we've been through the fuel system, we've been through the electrical system, see if we can get this engine running again. And that brings up a common problem with V8-powered Jeeps, the exhaust system. The stock exhaust system was restrictive as heck, so most people put on headers but the narrow frame makes it a tight fit around the starter and the clutch linkage. And creative exhaust work is required from the headers back. The first step is to get the old headers and the exhaust out of the way. And this not only reveals how cobbled up this exhaust was, but also some creative trimming on the skid plate. Okay, the old exhaust system is off, now what? Well, fortunately, Hooker came out with a solution to the old long tube header issue with these fender well headers. Now, these take the exhaust outside the frame rails down into a collector side pipe muffler combination. Now, I know what you're thinking. This usually means you have to cut out your inner fenders, which it looks cool on a gasser like this but not really something that you want on a Jeep that's gonna be flipping mud up onto those headers. Fortunately, you don't have to cut out the inner fenders with these, just a little trim. Let me show you what I'm talking about. As you can see, not only do all the pipes tuck right in behind the inner fender, but all of the factory braces still fit too. Speaking of the braces and the battery tray, now is a good time to clean those up and paint them or replace them if they're bad. Also, these Jeeps were notorious for rusting here on the rockers and up in the floors. Fortunately, ours doesn't have any rust through, but as you can see, it's got some surface rust starting. And if we don't do something about that in a couple years, we're going to have some rust holes. So we're going to clean that up and put on a coat of this POR15 rust preventative paint. Now this is designed to paint right over rusty metal and stop it in its tracks. But before we do this, we're going to lay out our side pipe. Now, like we said before, these headers are designed specifically for the Jeep CJ vehicles. And you can tell by the way they fit. However, this side pipe muffler collector thing is not a direct fit. It's a universal fit, which means you are going to have to come up with your own rear hanger here. But it comes with all of the bracketry and hardware that you're going to need to make your own hanger. Now, the cool thing about this is that you can make this outlet go wherever you want. You can take it straight out the side, you can angle it, you can turn it straight down, you can do whatever you want here. We're going to mount ours at about a 45 degree here. Okay, with the exhaust system dialed in, let's talk about tires. Now, when we bought the Jeep, it came with a brand new set of 35 inch tall tires and some old aluminum rims. Unfortunately, a 35 1250 is too big for a four inch lift on a CJ. Now, it may look cool going down the highway, but it's gonna rub like crazy if you go off road and start getting those axles moving. So, we're gonna drop the size down to a 33 1250 from a 35. Now what that's going to do is drop the height down a little bit, but still give us the same width. And then the rubber we're going to use is this Mickey Thompson Baja Boss. This is probably the best all around extreme mud tire that they make. For traction, you've got big wide voids here, and then you've got these little mud scoops to dig 
and then the side biters are 50% bigger. And then for handling, you have an asymmetrical tread design, which is quieter, and it also gives you better handling. This is a really nice all-around tire. Now we're going to wrap that around these classic Baja locks because this is just a great classic design, never goes out of style, and the size that we're going to use is a 15 by 10 because if you use your Jeeps off-road, it's nice to have that sidewall. Unfortunately, we are about out of time on this project today, but we have a new exhaust system on here. We've been through the fuel system. We've been through the electrical system, all with the assumption that this thing is going to run. So we probably ought to turn the key and find out. Oh man, oil pressure looks good. It's 50 pounds. Volts, things are charging. Man, this is great. And now, Brake Tech, brought to you by Bear Brakes, brakes without limits. You know, there's one thing that every project needs, whether it's a stock restoration or a full-on custom, and that's good brakes. And brake upgrades have been around for a long time. But there's a lot more to upgrading your brakes and making them work properly than bolting on the biggest rotors and calipers that you can find. Now, that might look cool, but that's not going to help you stop better unless everything's working together. So today we're going to look at the master cylinder. Now, since the whole thought process of most gearheads is to pull parts off of one car and put them on another, it's no surprise that most hot rod projects have a brake system that's been pieced together, hasn't been well thought out, and it's not working properly. And the problems usually start with the master cylinder. So here are some master cylinder do's and don'ts. If you're going to run power brakes, you want a master cylinder that's got a bore larger than one inch. And most of your aftermarket master cylinders have the bore written right on the side. As you can see, this is too small to run with power brakes. However, manual brakes, you need to use a one inch or smaller bore. So that's perfect for manual brakes. Also, a drum brake master cylinder is different than a disc brake master cylinder in the fact that it moves less fluid and sometimes they have a 10 pound residual valve in the outlets to keep pressure on the drums when you release the pedal. So don't mix them up. Now how do you know if you have? Well, if you have to pump your brake pedal several times to build pressure when you stop or the brakes are dragging when you release the pedal, you're probably using a drum master cylinder with disc brakes. If you have a front disc rear drum combination on your vehicle, make sure that you plumb the larger reservoir to the discs. Now, one question that always comes up is, how do you know if your master cylinder is bad? Well, a consistently spongy pedal is a good indicator. And also, if you push on the pedal and hold it, and it slowly keeps sinking down to the floor, that's a good indicator too. Single reservoir master cylinders were done away with in the 1950s because of safety. And even though they look cool on a retro or a rat rod, it's a good idea to upgrade to a dual master cylinder if you're going to drive the vehicle a lot. Finally, when it comes to replacing your master cylinder, I recommend that you stay away from junkyard or remanufactured units because they have a high failure rate. Your best bet is to go to a reputable aftermarket company and get something that you know is going to match the rest of the system. Tool Tech, brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals. There is no doubt that part of being a car person is dealing with shiny stuff. Whether it's polishing paint or metal or chrome or whatever, it seems like there is always something to polish. And even though you were born with a couple of natural tools for polishing stuff, sometimes your old hands could use some help. And that's where a buffer comes in. Now, just to be clear, I'm not talking about a hand buffer for buffing paint. I'm talking about a stationary pedestal buffer for buffing metal. 
Now, I know that there are some of you that are probably thinking, why in the world would I need that? I'll just use my hands and some polish, or I'll get one of these ball things that goes on a drill. And there's nothing wrong with that. Both are good tools. But remember, the idea behind tools is to make your life easier. And the question is, would a buffer do that? Well, let's find out. Okay, what we have here is a vintage copper and brass fire extinguisher that obviously has been sitting in somebody's garage for decades and is all tarnished and nasty and no longer looks like it once did. The challenge is to see if we can bring it back to its former glory. So we're going to start with a polish and do this area right here by hand. As you can see, it's messy and there is a ton of elbow grease involved as you apply both pressure and a rubbing action to clean the metal. And after some time and some aching hands, we have an area with a definite shine that looks pretty good. Now we're gonna move to the buffer. And an easy way to tell a buffer from a grinder is the longer shafts that stick out to give you access to the buffing pads and the power level. You gotta have enough power to polish the metal when you lay into it. Using the right buffing pad and compound is important too. To remove the tarnish, we'll start with a firm spiral sewn buff and some Tripoli compound. Now the Tripoli is a medium compound that cuts well to start and then finishes with a nice polish. Also, as with any buffing tool, being aware of your edges and corners is extremely important because if you catch an edge, it can pull the part out of your hands and destroy it or can cause you some serious physical damage. The next step is to move to a white rouge compound and a loose section buff to do the final polishing. Okay, let's see the difference. Now, obviously, this is the area that we just did with the buffer, <laughs> and you can see the reflection of my hand in the metal. That's awesome. Now, under this tape is the area that we thought looked good that we did by hand, and you can see it doesn't even start to compare when you see the reflection of what the buffer did. And this took us a good solid 10 minutes and a lot of elbow grease. This took just a few minutes. Now, obviously, there's still a lot of places where you're gonna wanna use your hands to polish, and there's places where these buff balls are gonna come in handy. But if you wanna seriously polish some metal, you may wanna look at adding a buffer to your bag of tricks. What are you working on? Brought to you by Woodward Fabrication, selling quality metalworking equipment since 1966. Today's What Are You Working On comes from Chris Leach, and he is in Florida. And Chris's project is a 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner. Yeah, one of the iconic muscle cars of the whole era. Now, this is not so much about the car he's building and more about the history of the car that he grew up with. So check this out. The car was his mom and dad's daily driver back in the day. He said his mom drove it up till 81. And of course, his dad up kept it and painted it and kept it nice. And Chris says this is the car he actually learned to drive a stick with. So this is a four speed car. That's even better. Probably a 383. Mm, what a great car. Now, he said that after he joined the Navy, his dad just let the car sit for about 20 years. Then he decided to put it back together in the mid 2000s, his father did, and then he painted it and he drove it and he just had a ball with it. Now fast forward a few more years, Chris gets out of the Navy, he visits his parents, his parents say, why don't you take the car from California back with you to Florida, it's yours. <laughs> so Chris takes the car, of course he did. So now Chris has the car in Florida, he starts enjoying it, and he's driving it all the time, just driving the crap out of it. He says that he's just doing small things to it, upkeeping it, and he has found on these old cars that there's always something to do, which is what is so fun about him. Another thing he's found, check this out, his grandson loves the car, and at five years old, he loves to be out there getting dirty, working on the car with his grandpa. And I bet that grandson will learn to drive a stick in that car. I just bet you money. 
What a cool history, what a cool project. So to recognize such a cool project, we hooked up with our buddies at Woodward Fab, and we're gonna give you one of these tubing notchers. Now this uses a hole saw to notch tubing. That way you can do fish mouths and angle cuts and all kinds of things in tubing. So you can build tube chassis or frames or roll bars or all kinds of cool stuff. It's a great tool. Also, since you're obviously a real gearhead, we're gonna give you one of our gears t-shirts and we're gonna give you one of our deluxe project planning books. That's gonna be real important to keep track of all the stuff you've done to that Roadrunner, especially when it comes time for maintenance. Then we're gonna give you one of our Sergeant Rock die casts and I recommend that you give that to that grandson. Now, for the rest of you guys, if you wanna get in on this, get your project featured on the show, man, you gotta send it to us. Go to our website, go to Gears Nation, and submit it into what are you working on. The website's also the place to find out more information on any products you may have seen on the show, any Gears merchandise, and how to join Gears Nation so you can stream any of our episodes commercial free. Also, don't forget to check us out on Amazon Prime where you can watch past and current seasons of Gears and check out our new show, Stacy David's Restoration Series. Finally, don't forget to like us on Facebook and Instagram so you can get some behind the scenes footage of our weekly web series, Shifting Gears. And if you're a radio person, make sure you check out our new podcast, Tales of a Gearhead. Okay, that wraps it up for us today. It means it's time for you to get out there and find yourself a project. It could be an old Jeep, it's something simple, but something hopefully you can pass down to your grandkids. We'll see you next time. Thank you.